you hope. Okay, so um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, Dan, can you uh, paste that code again so that everybody who's here now can see the code? Yeah, certainly. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, Dan was asking, uh, why does this throw rather than silently doing nothing? Um, and I was explaining that it actually used to silently do nothing, and then I asked for it to be changed to throwing. Uh, and the reason is that uh, uh, I feel very strongly that when the program and the computation state proceeds in a way that violates the programmer's expectation of what they thought their code meant, that the a computation should not simply proceed on the same um, control flow paths that were written assuming success. Um, so that could be throwing an exception, it could be you know, aborting the whole virtual machine, it could be pretty much anything other than um, uh, just proceeding as if everything was normal. Um, uh, and I took that philosophy, and that was the, the reason why uh, in the design of strict mode, um, uh, I, I changed the uh, old ECMAScript 3 behavior that uh, failed assignments would be silent and turned them into failed assignments through. Uh, likewise, um, uh, delete returned a true or false, but it was true on, uh, so often that there was a lot of code that didn't check for it. Uh, so in that case, I also had in strict mode the false case throw. Uh, that's a little bit more severe because there's actually a documented way to observe whether it succeeded or failed. Um, uh, but in this case, because uh, the SES behavior is a delta from the ECMAScript behavior, when the SES behavior um, uh, is such that it fails, you know, that the difference is that something failed that would have succeeded in SES, I think that those failures should should generally be on the uh, not on the success path. Right, but uh, so it, it, does that mean that this uh, making this throw should be something that we put in place in SES, not in the Realm Shim? Uh, so I wasn't when I said that I wasn't distinguishing Realm Shim from SES, uh, and and actually I want to. Um, uh, I think maybe this is actually a, a good central topic. Uh, JF and I especially were brainstorming also with, with, with Michael and Dean about sort of re refactoring what the boundaries are between uh, the realm shim and the underlying um, uh, eight, eight magic lines of code evaluation mechanism and SES. Um, the um, but the realm, but but the realm shim. I right. It's got to be. I I think it has to be the case in the realm shim as well, because the realm shim is also fundamentally changing the nature of the evaluators uh, and it's setting up and it's preparing an environment for being able to support multiple constructors within that root realm and um, and the but, so the do you mean um, so if, if I create a rural realm and I'm evaluating code there that is attempting to do these it should fail I think so. I think it should it, sh it should fail and it should fail noisily. I not not by it should not fail silently. Um, and, and the reason is because if you don't do that, then if you create compartments, you will be able to access things that you're not supposed to access. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's also with regard to getting to an evaluator from a simple object by, prop by named pro property traversal. Um, uh, one of the things that, that's you know, happened, um, uh, I think 
uh, all in the last year is Mike Samuel uh, really rubbing all of our noses in the degree to which even a system with only trusted code that looks very, very normal can still be misled by malicious user data into looking up the function constructor by this constructor constructor navigation and then feeding something into it that, that's also user data that then gets. So basically, uh, this, this by itself, simply being able to navigate from an innocent object to an evaluator by named property lookup is an injection attack uh, driven purely by data against only trust and code. And then when you add in the fact that we're trying to um, uh, enable um, uh, different levels and kinds of trust of different code, um, uh, I think that this constructor dot constructor thing is not something we want to reach a working evaluator. And if it's not going to work as an evaluator, it shouldn't be silent. It should throw. Okay. No, I, I mean that, that makes sense. I. I... I have no objections on this. Uh, I, I don't think code is doing that anyways today. They, they, they part of the of us adopting the round tree might, might introduce this as a breaking change, but no one should be using this at least. So it might be, we, can, we might take that bullet. And the, the last question is, if in our case right now, which we don't use um, compartments, um, at the moment, it's just the root room. Is it going to be possible for us to, during the initialization of the ROM, reintroduce this behavior in a way that is okay to use? And uh, in case that we're breaking someone at the moment, we might be able to reintroduce this behavior on top of the uh, chain and um, get away with it. So, uh, yes, um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the realm shim, uh, both currently and with the new layering that we're about to discuss, in both cases, it creates a root, it's, you know, it's about creating a root realm that has uh, safety properties, but in which the primordials are not frozen. Uh, so the way I, the way I think of it is that uh, the the realm shim uh, is still bringing about OCAP safety rules, but it's bringing about OCAP safety rules where the unit of protection is the root realm, and then what what SES adds on top of that uh, is the enforcement of OCAP safety rules uh, within a root realm where the individual object is the unit of protection. And because it's not freezing the primordials, that means that code within the root realm can mess with the primordials as it likes, uh, but only using what it has. So because the, um, you know, in the initial state of a new root realm under the realm shim, there is a function constructor named function. And because uh, function.prototype is mutable, uh, the startup code in there could reinstall it yeah. as function.prototype.constructor. There's, there's, under those assumptions, there's no way to stop that. So, you might, so, so it's just a feature that that's allowed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we might, we might be able to do that, Jan, and then just go, go ahead with that. And then attempting to, maybe we can attempt to introduce the round with this rule. And then if we fail, then we can he would and I did your thing. Yeah. yeah. Another, another thing that we're doing um, uh, both in the old shim and that we're preserving in the new layering uh, is that uh, creating a secured environment, which applies um, uh, both at the, realm, at the realm shim level and at this lower level mechanism, which we're about to talk about. Uh, in both cases, there's an options bag uh, and the principle that we're following is for a lot of these things where you'd rather be more compatible and you're willing to sacrifice some safety, that um, uh, 
that for, for some of them, uh, we provide a configuration option for turning off the safety in order to gain the greater compatibility. For example, uh, uh, to support better debugging experience while in developer mode. Um, uh, the, but, the, but, the, but the principle there with the options bag is that everything defaults to the safe set so that you have to explicitly use an option to make it unsafe. Uh, we're not providing direct support for an option on this one because it's simple and, and could, well, actually, because it never occurred to me that anybody might want it. Um, but it would not be a, it would be consistent with the other things we're making switchable by options to make the switchable by option if there was a reason to. Okay. Yes, yeah. right now, we, uh, I think the PR argument is, is the path that we want to go where we can configure the class itself, the shim itself, and then every compartment and every rhythm created from the, using that shim instance will inherit all the options. Is that, is that the path? So there, there, there is, uh, uh, yes, uh, but we need to distinguish. Uh, there are options that are only meaningful per root realm. Correct. And then there are other options that are meaningful per compartment. And there are yet other options that are meaningful, meaningful per evaluation. So one of, one of the things to, to you know, as, we, as we're doing all this to gain clarity on is which options are meaningful at, at which of those three levels. Those are really the three primary levels. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, when, when we discuss this in the issue, I was saying that um, ideally we try to not introduce, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of when we get the realm implemented by browser and I, what is the amount of work that you have to do in order to be able to use that instead of what we have. Uh, and uh, obviously there will be changes. We can, we, we can all agree that there will be changes that you have to make and how big those changes are going to be is, 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 is probably the, the, the right question there. And ideally we can design the layering in a way that once we get the, re the realm from the browsers, there's not much to change in terms of uh, the creation of the root realm and compartment. Um, and most of the options are lifted up to some sort of wrapper around the native APIs. Yeah, yeah. If so, so we have in this case with access. Yeah, so, so um, yeah, we're, we're, I think we're completely aligned there. And we actually have one of our necessary target deployments uh, actually imposes a lot of those constraints on us directly and very much affected our design, uh, which is XS in SES mode. Uh, uh, computation starts off already in SES. There is no prior JavaScript for creating the SES environment. Uh, so in that case, uh, the way you know, the, the code that we write that starts an SES application has to run the same way when it's the start code in, in, in the XS SES machine and has to also, that start code also has to be the same code that you run when you have sort of a prior initialization code that creates the SES environment for the start code to start up in. Another, another thing that um, I, I feel that is also important is that, yeah, sometimes you want to really create things that are very different, uh, like a, a, my, my main concern is that because we believe that people will have to have these three different layers of configuration. Um, those configuration have to be in the API that use that configuration. Uh, it's, it's potentially uh, problematic because then we, that we will divert, because some of these configurations are just because of limitations of the chain. We we'll have uh -huh. to use APIs that are specific Okay. to the chain implementation. 
So okay. we could, uh, in some cases, we could lift it up to the factory of the chain. And you really want to have different implementations that have completely different set of rules. Maybe you just create different versions of the of the ROM uh, machine via the factory. So you can still get to the point where you have two different root realms that have completely different set of rules. And that's fine because you're loading the, the, the machine once, creating two ROM implementations that are, are using different set of, of uh, configurations. Um, I, I guess that's going to be a sort of a escape hatch where people who really want to have different configurations still can do it. There's a little bit of a, a problem because you have to have two separate rule realm, but it um, doesn't seem like crazy to me that, 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 that that's sufficient for many of the cases where you really want to have different configurations. Okay, so, uh, so having, being able to create different root realms that have different settings is certainly aligned with our thinking. Uh, on platforms for which it's possible to create multiple root realms. One of the things that we're also um, uh, very much aware of and we're trying to be compatible with uh, is the XS virtual machine only has one root realm. So that's, a, that's an example where you just have to work inside the SES root realm that you're in, but you can create multiple compartments inside there. Uh, a browser worker is the same thing uh, right now, uh, there's no way to create a second root realm in the same worker. Um, uh, and therefore, the shim, uh, there's no way for a shim to work around that. Um, and uh, the, um, I'm not sure that, that it's well motivated to try to introduce multiple root realms within, such that they can coexist within one worker. Um, uh, so, so given both of those cases, one of the things we're trying to do with the separation of root realm uh, versus compartment is to have the full compartment API and functionality available in those restricted environments and simply have the root realm API be absent. So, um, I, I, um... Let me, let me say this and then we can go back to what you just said because I think I, I didn't get all the details. And one thing that um, I would like to see explore is the two, two, main, two main things that I would like to be, uh, I'd like to explore with the, with the Scheme API. Uh, the first one is that um, there are things that we could completely abstract out because those are things that could be done uh, after the, the ROM okay. is initialized. Sort of. Here, here's the, cons the constraint uh, that we've, that um, the constraint I want to apply that we've, we have been applying uh, to that abstraction, uh, which is by default, you have to be in a safe state. So the kind of thing that we just talked about of reinstalling the function constructor under function.prototype.constructor, that would be a perfectly fine thing for code to do after initialization. You right. do not need to make it an option because the initial state is safe. Uh, right, there's some right. other things where the, op the purpose of the option is to not make the initial state safe in a way that you can't recreate from a safe state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get it, get it. So that's the second. That's the second thing that I would like to explore. So the first one, just to recap, the first one is when we encounter a functionality that does not need in, um, uh, access to the internals of the team uh, code um, that can be just run as after the the, 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 the initialization of the of the realm object uh, we should move them into specific libraries and things that we could use uh, optionally so you import it and you call it you, call, you pass the realm and then you get the, the behavior um, right. we need to identify which ones are those um, and obviously they don't necessarily have to be part of the chain the second one 
is what you just said. There are um, things that necessarily need access to the internals of the machine code to in order to be able to be effective. Uh, and those things, um, we have only two options. Either those are part of the machine itself via some configuration, or we open some sort of, we, we get a little bit more cr creative with some, maybe some gymnastics that we have to do, but um, it might be that we put it at the factory level or something where if provided, we use, the team will use it, otherwise it will not use it to do extra work and expose on internal functionalities of it. And the reason for that is um, right now, the team is at 60K uh, around that uh, when you bundle up. Um, for many use cases and many folks who use the team is not a big deal. Um, when you just ship and minify that is about 17K, not a lot of code, but um, there is a, 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 a lot of things going on when the team is either evaluated or when the team or when a realm is created, there is a lot of work happening there. And many of those, many of the users of the team will never use it. And, yes. And, and I, so uh, by moving some pieces out by saying, let's say, let me, let me give you an example, which I don't know if it is a good example or not, but let me give you anyway. Um, so if you need to have, uh, if, if endowments is a thing that you use, well, can we get endowments to be something that is pluggable? So I, I, I can import endowments library and pass it as an option when, when I'm creating the, 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 the ROM constructor or creating the ROM itself. And if I don't provide it and there's no endowment, there's a, the whole branch of code that goes away and it's not needed. Uh, similarly, for example, the team itself has a forking logic right now where if it is in node, detecting node and use the VM uh, context. If not, it will, it will assume that it's a browser, it will do the other thing. Um, so for a group of people that never use a team in node like us, well, all that code that is needed for that is not really relevant and there is no way to really uh, appreciate that at the moment because it's built in inside the, the shim and there's no way to take it out unless that you copy and remove those branches manually. And that's the kind of things that I feel that we might be able to lift it up to options and pass it over and, and saying, well, if you really want to have a different construction process for the, for, for, for the intrinsics, then you can provide that as a function and we use it to create the intrinsics, something like that. Yeah. Um, Kerry D, I think uh, you touched a lot of very, very important points. Um, uh, one is the, the, the size of the library and the complexity. And uh, we are uh, aware of this from a different angle because the, in the light of the vulnerabilities that have happened this week, uh, most of them, except which, one, which, which are uh, not publicly disclosed. Yeah. So shh. Yeah. Uh, most of them are, are related to things that happen in a realm and not in a compartment. They happen between 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 realms. Between realm. And um, so, one thing that we we are uh, aiming for is to split instead of having one shim, is to split the problem into specific use cases. So just by the architecture, we'll be able to remove code that doesn't need to be involved in. Uh, a specific use case, for example, uh, the compartment versus the wrap. So that's one. And but the other thing you're bringing in that's that's quite interesting, and it could be a creation or a build pattern where some of the options of the uh, of the shim are removed, like the node. Uh, that that could be a way to like the node, the node detection, the support for node at, at the library. Oh, oh, right. Because what it, what Kerry is saying is that the lookup for VM in order to create a new root realm okay. is code that is dead in their case and should be removed. Yeah. So that that could be another pattern. But um, yeah, I, I think I, the I, biggest I, benefit will come from uh, the envision uh, separation between uh, from one shim to two shims to to target two different use cases. Yeah, yeah I, I think uh, the build process is also a, a, a very interesting 
uh, thing, and I think uh, we can help with that as well. Like if the target is common JS, then you, you get the common JS pieces of it for Node and such because we know you're going to use it in Node. Um, so we, we could do some of that, yeah, for sure. I, I'm going to take a, a, a few moments to redraw. Uh, okay. So, so you guys keep talking. Uh, by the way, uh, announcement. I don't know if we've ever announced here at these meetings. Uh, JF uh, ha has moved from Salesforce to Agoric. Woohoo! <laughs> and still not talking that about big of a change. Huh? Not, not that big of a change. <laughs> right. Right. Um, I have a question. Um, if if we're just talking, I uh, I came in a few minutes late because uh, my IT department forced a reboot on my machine when it was not a good time. Um, I I I missed the initial context for this discussion. So maybe if JF could take two minutes and explain that while Mark is doing his drawing. Yeah, um, I think that we started with a discussion. Uh, we're going to paste it again on the side uh, question by, by Diane about the behavior of this line of code with the current chip, which uh, calling uh, any of the function constructor by walking up the prototype chain uh, throws. And why we made the decision. And, and so we started looking at that and then expanding on um, what should be the default behavior of a, of a realm, uh, especially considering the amount of code that is in the current shim and that deals with uh, very different use cases and trying, is trying to be everything for everybody. Uh, so Carrie has uh, left, uh, raised a few points that uh, yeah, in, in, in the GitHub repo, there's some, it perceives a lot of complexity. Um, uh, there's also the point that uh, the Realm shim is able currently to support Node, but on pl some platforms uh, don't uh, are never going to use the Realm in a the Realm shim in a uh, Node context. So that's dead code for them. So there's uh, uh, now as, there's a, an appetite from uh, different angles to reduce complexity. Oh, and we're talking about the uh, different ways to reduce that complexity. Okay, and I've drawn my layer diagram. I'm now going to uh, let's see. Jeff, can you Thanks. click on our own picture so I can see what's being projected? So okay. Position whiteboard. Okay, good. There's a word. There. Yeah, there's a word going over instead of under. Okay. This, is, this is a wrinkle on screen sharing that I don't think I've encountered before. <laughs> <laughs> Two adult humans to pick up and carry the, uh, the screen. Okay, and I know there's a zoom control on the camera. All right. This is fancy. Can go down? There we go. Wow. Okay. I can read it. Okay, so uh, and first of all, before I start talking through uh, Michael and JF, just do a, a quick sanity check. Is this the layering we're talking about? So, yeah, I think it will. Okay, good. So, um, we, so we're, we're, we're doing this refactoring and it's really working out beautifully and the, the, the individual pieces are much more decoupled and much smaller. And the key thing is um, starting with the evaluator at the bottom. The evaluator uh, is really just a little bit of scaffolding around the, ma the eight magic lines of code. Uh, and, it, and what it presents is the ability to create an evaluation context that has its own global scope and its own evaluators, and is only about evaluating strings as programs inside the scope that it creates. Um, 
And the evaluator, the, so, there, so I, I drew a mutual dependence here. There's something that the, the, the place where execution, if you're starting from a full JavaScript environment, then before you get to the evaluator, you go through an API called Lockdown. Uh, if you're starting, as we are under Access, with an, what's already an SES virtual machine, then the, the code that is the starting point of your application, the code that's your main, uh, is code that's evaluating in an evaluation context as if it was already made by an evaluator. And that's your uh, starting evaluation context. Uh, I want to, uh, to make this easier to talk about, um, I want to introduce a terminology change, which is with this layering and this API construction, um, Root realms are now a more different as a concept than the rest of it. So rather than saying both compartments and root realms are kind of realms, I'm going to say that we reserve the name realm for the root realm, and we find ourselves always correcting our speech anyway, that when we mean root realm, we often just say realm. Uh, and the general category that include, um, is you know, the general category is really evaluation context, which in fact we re rarely need to talk about uh, uh, in, in, in a way that has to include realms as well as compartments. Um, so in any case, so over here, this stack over here without realm is all. Uh, compatible with an environment like the worker that uh, only supports one root realm. This box over here is the only thing that is aware of the possibility of creating a new root realm. So that's what this API should be about. Um, but that new root realm has to have an evaluation context. So this really does depend on this. Um, the, um, the, the, the module loading here is, uh, we've, we've got a, as builders of a shim, there's a substantial piece of logic here that, has, that, that really doesn't depend on the rest of this, that you could use outside of all these mechanisms as well, that turn modules into evaluable strings in a way that we're much more confident is semantics preserving. Uh, we, we've continued to run into um, problems with roll-up and with ESM, where they were not semantics preserving in subtle ways. Uh, and uh, the deeper problem is that the target of the, the, per, the, the, the correctness criteria for those rewrites is to preserve what will happen. In other words, if according to the semantics of the source code, the code, if correct, will do certain things, then under the rewrite, it should still do those things. Uh, we are equally concerned with what, what won't happen. Um, and the rewrites are not designed to treat that as an, a, a, a first-class concern. They're, they're often not designed to treat it as a concern as a whole. And um, you, you, know, mean I, the, you mean the rewrites that, like bundlers that... That's right. That's yeah. right. Roll-up and ESM and Webpack and others... Um, uh, are they, they're doing uh, a more invasive rewrite than what we're doing. And the strong claim we can make about our rewrite is that uh, for fun since functions, um, since, 
since the thing that needs rewriting to turn modules into valuable strings are import and export, and import and export cannot occur within functions, um, as long as there's no import expressions or import.meta, which are the, the two new unfortunate special cases, but, but as long as the function code has none of them, then the rewritten module will preserve exactly character for character the original source code of the function. Uh, so, um, I'll just add a, I'll add a motivating ca caveat to this. That, that presumes that we have access to something like a compartment where the module can have its own global scope that does not interfere with others. Ah, 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 ah. Good point. I think I was missing that. So there actually is... Yes, that's true. Yeah. There actually is that dependence because of the way in which we're rewriting um, uh, live bindings. Our live bindings depends on this. So that's true. Um, so that's so that's the the layering of shims, and the layering of proposed standards can be somewhat different. But we should be shimming a subset of the semantics that we want to propose. Um, uh, and when I say subset, I also want to, uh, something Kariti said is something that I had not been noticing, and we should definitely go over all of our options with respect to. Some of our options are options that will survive into the standard, that we're saying these are meaningful even when these things are implemented directly, and some of the options just have to do with the fact that the shim cannot at, cannot fully implement what we're going to spec. So we need to, to be very careful to distinguish those two. And let, let me give a, a, just a concrete example of something that um, uh, is currently an option uh, that only has to do with limitations of the shim, which is, uh, the, uh, do we reject source code that contains something in the, that's in the syntactic form of a direct eval call. In other words, just the identifier eval open and then some, ex, some, you know, some, some expression here close. Uh, this thing as an expression is not necessarily a direct eval call, but it's potentially a direct eval call. Uh, I think what we're going to specify is that this actually has the semantics of a direct eval. Um, uh, direct eval, by the way, there's no violation of direct eval uh, with regard to object capability rules. Um, uh, as, long as, as long as everybody understands that it's a special form, that it's not a function call. If you mistake it for a function call, then it's definitely doing things that a function call can't do. Our shim cannot turn this into a direct eval. There's just no practical way to do that, um, uh, or there's or at least no practic practical way that I'm willing to try doing that. Um, there is a possible way that, that Sala and I sketched that might work, but is terrifying um, uh, um, in the sense of not being, you know, how hard you have to look at it to be confident it's preserving security. Um, so in any case, so what the shim does is it scans the code and if it sees this syntax, um, uh, it rejects the source code. And the reason it does that is not security. If it did not reject, and in fact before it rejects, uh, this has the semantics under the shim of an indirect eval which is also perfectly safe by OCAP rules. The only reason we're rejecting it is so that the code that is accepted under the shim will continue to work under the proposal. Uh, so therefore, since under the proposal, this will have a behavior we can't shim, we want to reject it for now. So um, just a comment about it, the, the general idea I, I don't know how much you remember 
about our conversation with uh, Yehuda and Dave um, about two years ago, one year ago or something. We're, we were saying, we were trying to figure what to do with the ROMs and all that. And, and we were saying, well, the evaluator is really eating out the, 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 the ROM itself. So it's really about the evaluation as the key part. And uh, at the time, I remember that even we were planning to change the proposal to focus on the evaluator uh, rather than the, the full ROM implementation. Um, I do not remember why we backtracked from that <laughs> um, and continue to push for the ROM as the building block that we want, not the evaluator as a building block that we want. And yep. it, it would be interesting to try to remember why. Mm -hmm. But this, at the first glance, this makes makes sense for me. In 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 any case, for example, what Dejan is doing right now with their team, I think the end is creating only a compartment. He never really creates a, a ROM um, itself, a root ROM. Uh, it just creates a compartment because he needs the evaluation control, not really the the the, the other part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um. So I also so so um, uh, so I, actually let me, let me try out a hypothesis on you, Kareti. Um, so you're not freezing the primordials. You're using a root realm as a unit of isolation, and therefore you you are depending on this. Um, the the thing I want the thing I, I want to probe is if you take all of the steps to secure the environment that SES does, uh, except with um, a, a small number of configuration parameters for us to negotiate that allows you to turn off some of that securing for some reasons, like allowing this syntax, even though the meaning is different. Um, so if you, if we basically, if SES and what you're doing shared all of the locking down behavior to take the root realm that you're in and turn it into something with good security properties. And then once you've turned it into something with good security properties, um, that let's say that one of the switches there is whether you freeze the primordials. So it simply becomes a switch setting not to freeze the primordials. So if you freeze the primordials, then basically you're in SES. And if you don't freeze the primordials, what I'm, what I'm wanting to know is, is that system, the, is that sort of the salient difference between what you need and what's on this diagram? I don't know yet. I have to think about it. Okay, good, good. So um, uh, I'm very encouraged that the answer was not no. Okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, seriously, that, that means that it's subtle enough that if the answer turns out to be no, maybe there's something to negotiate to turn the answer back into a yes. Um, the, okay, so let me talk about the... I think the, the, the uh, removal of properties are going to be that the, the walls turn Oh, right, 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 right. So another thing to make switchable is the, the we have a whitelist not only of global names, uh, um, we have a whitelist of all primordial properties. And what SES does on initialization is it walks the primordials, it actually walks them twice. It walks them once to remove every property it finds that is not in the full whitelist and it walks the primordials again to freeze the primordials. And I suspect you're going to want to turn both of those off. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, and that's fine. Uh, I, I think, you know, our, our architecture is, is, is completely, it's, it's completely coherent within this architecture for both of those to be switchable. Okay. So, here was the key realization that was driven by this excess use case. Oh, let me mention another thing about the excess use case. That machine 
supports modules directly, including the module semantics of compartments, which is, um, uh, in it, which is intended to support the full least authority linkage of modules uh, that we've been building towards. So a module rewrite where you, modules are rewritten to valuable strings is completely besides the point for the XS environment. Um, the subset, uh, the, the component of, um, Yeah, it doesn't really even need the, since, since the evaluator is really only about the scope of evaluable strings, I think in the XS environment, this is missing and this is missing. We're just starting off with the world that both of these create, and we're starting off here. Okay, um, so here was a new, and I think quite important realization that came from thinking through the lockdown. In the SES and Realms architecture, as we've been building it, where it, we did not have this decoupling, um, uh, we solved the problem of initial authority in, in one particular way, in a way that's very similar to how we did it in Kaha, where you've got the realm that you're starting in has whatever host objects give you the initial authority, document, window, or a node, the built-in require and process, whatever. Um, uh, so there's all of these globals, which are sources of power that are outside the language. And uh, what we were doing, both in SES in Agoric, what Agoric is actually still doing because we haven't switched to this, um, uh, and what we're doing in Kaha, and I think, Kariti, what you're doing, if I understand it, in your system, is that you make a new root realm, you make, and then you membrane the source of powers in the realm that you're starting with, and then you endow the initial execution context in the new root realm with a membrane version of those powers. That's correct. That's correct. And then, and, and if you think about a little bit more about that, they, um, we have, we are exploring other options as well. Uh, JD and myself, uh, it might be cases that we can even use an iframe for that. Like if, 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 if really, if, if really the, the sandbox is the iPhone and the membrane is the one that gives you the power to really talk to the outer window. That might be also sufficient, uh, we, even without the evaluator. So we, 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 we still have to explore a bunch of things, but the idea is what you described, like uh, okay. exactly what you described. Okay, good. Um, so um, I, I have a question about that. Okay. What kind of membrane? Go ahead. What kind of membrane? Oh, Mark, Mark said, oh, it's, it's got a membrane. What, what kind of membrane is it? What's okay. the membrane doing? So this is, uh, so I'm referring to the membrane that Kariti showed us. Uh, I think that's, you know, that, that's, as far as I know, the, the membrane that we need. I didn't see anything that, that did not fit. Um, uh, and I call it a general purpose membrane for a JavaScript environment, but that's a very long name. Yeah, the membrane was parameterized with two functions. One function is always called when going from, you know, whatever you want. I need to name the two sides to talk about it. I'm going to, I'm going to go back to the terminology that Tom and I use that everybody hates, wet and dry. Um, uh, so one of the functions is called every time a dry value uh, goes through to become a wet value on the other side. Um, uh, and then the other function is called when you go the other way. And if those two functions are absent, uh, it's, um, it's equivalent to using the identity function. Uh, and if, and th so those two functions are the entirety of where distortions come from. 
And if those functions act like the identity function, then there's no distortion. Yeah, so it's, it's only one function, Mark. It's only one function because um, it's only, it's only use, it's, it's only one distortion because the idea is that uh, in order for the sandbox to observe something from the outer realm um, through the membrane, uh, it must reveal that piece of the object graph from the outer realm via the membrane and we apply the distortion and we create the map between the two versions of the object. But the outer realm will never discover anything new out of the um, inner realm uh, or the, the sandbox. It will never discover any new object there unless that the sandbox is actually providing that up front with the other distortion mechanism. So it's really one way when you come back, you already have the map. And if it is not in the map, it's not, there's nothing to do with it. Uh, so that, so, so I have so many questions. Uh, if the, if the default distortion is an identity, meaning no distortion, what's the point of having a membrane? Ah, the point of having a membrane is to introduce distortions. Uh, if you know you're not going to introduce insertion, uh, even revocation, which is the simplest uh, right. membrane, uh, even that is a distortion. Yes. Uh, if you're not going to distort at all, and you know that you're not, then then there's no particular reason to put a membrane. There. Well, um, we do we do the we do the membrane not only for distortion, we also do it for protection, because the. The, the invariance that we put in place with this membrane is that the membrane cannot affect the um, outer realm object graph, cannot mutate, cannot add new things or mutate the object graph. You're not doing outer. that with the, you're not doing that by distortion? I'm not doing that, uh, uh, I'm not, going well distortion in the sense of um not the distortion uh, uh, function that we pass to be, to be okay. clear it's not really about the distortion function that we provide is it just it's part of the it's part of this it's part of the implementation of the of the membrane itself that it will never allow you to make a mutation of the object graph of the outer rock the, the object graph of the outer realm, we call it uh, sacred. It never it never changes unless that the outer realm changes it. Okay. Um, I think there's a lot of issues there that I would like to talk through. Um, uh, what I did in the meantime is I added to the diagram just a new, a new blob here called membrane uh, because clearly in many uses of these mechanisms, uh, you don't have a coherent thing to use unless you're also using a membrane. Uh, and that's certainly true for what Caridi is doing, where he's separating new root realms. And it's still true in our world, um, uh, where everything's under one root realm, uh, there's still cases where you want to, to, to use a membrane. Um, yeah, uh, I'll be in New York next week, so we can brainstorm around that if you're there. Okay, um, good. But so, um, so, uh, there, there are a few things I want, I want to also cover there. By the way, the, remember the question that I asked a couple of weeks ago about if you know any API that violates the principle of receiving an object and, uh, and or not, not violate the, the principle, but uh, an API that we provide as part of the language or the host that will call it with an object that API observe mutations of that object that can happen in the next turn, and I found one. And you will be surprised <laughs> because it's the proxy handler. You give it an object, and if you attempt to pass that object through the membrane, that object is supposed to change over time. It could change shift. And it's a valid use case, but I haven't found any other API that does that with an object or an array. That's the only one. 
Okay. Okay, good. Um, good. Sorry, uh, there is one more point uh, just to complete the diagram. Um, I know it's secondary, but it, it, it just could, could elaborate on making it full circle. Um, we're talking about um, creating uh, instances that belong in one uh, particular, um, uh, you know, I say container as a generic term, uh, but it, it basically uh, belongs to a particular set of primordials if it's an instance. Uh, if it's a primitive, it just um, you know it just inherits the prototype. Um, you know when you when you're um, you know interacting with it, it doesn't matter where it is. Right, uh, right. The th the, just just to clarify, because because I, I remember it was a little subtle when I first understood this. Uh, a primitive doesn't have any tie to a realm whatsoever. So then the next question is, well, how does it? How does a number know? what number prototype to inherit properties from. Uh, and the answer is the code exactly. that contains the property lookup. The realm in which that code is running determines which number prototype that lookup of a property on the number uses as effectively the thing that the number inherits from. Um, uh, so, so it, it really goes to that point, um, you know, like um, how this, how the, how instances and, and primitives have historically been separated in such a way that an instance keeps everything, they only share the null, whereas the uh, primitives don't really have anything, they are really literally just the data um, and, and uh, instructions uh, for, for, for how the uh, operations execute upon them. Um, so, so now we're going to hit the point with with various um, um, instances wanting to actually assume they don't come from a different container of primordials. So, uh, so how you can, um, 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 I guess, uh, clean up or um, ensure that you, you can, can uh, substitute everything related to an instance so that it doesn't look like it came from that container, but from this container. Okay. Right. So, uh, so that, that was actually a lot of what we saw with Caridi's membrane. Uh, and it's, it's uh, uh, going back to the... Uh, as, okay, before I say the following, let me say that, um, uh, Sala, I know you and I, oh, and probably Michael as well, have access to the cloud recording that we're recording this session to. Um, uh, what I'm about to say, it's important that it not become public until after October 2nd. Um, uh, what we found is that, um, uh, the SES shim and the realm shim were making the same assumption that we saw in Caridi's membrane work, which is if you, if you create a function in realm A, and then, but, it's, but you create it only for use by realm B, uh, and then you rewire the function so that all the things it points at are only in realm B, and in the code of the function, uh, let's say it's a closed function. You use no global variables in the function, no global variables at all. Uh, you only use parameters and locals, then so it doesn't capture anything lexically, not even you know object. Um, the uh, assumption that we were making, and I think Caridi was making and showing us the membrane, is that that is safe. The thing that I want us to be careful not to discuss too deeply until October 2nd uh, is it's that's almost impossible to make safe. Um, uh, it's got a lot more holes in it than I expected, uh, a lot more holes, uh, and to the point where our inclination at this point is that all of the objects reachable by 
user objects in Realm A should only be objects, especially only be functions that are created in Realm A. So, um, uh, so that, that also implies some things about how carefully you have to construct a membrane so that the side of the membrane exposed to A uh, only consists of A objects and likewise for B. Uh, and we haven't thought through that membrane construction yet. Uh, but, um, uh, Correct. But, but that's the, that's the rewiring that we've all assumed was safe that we were probably wrong about. We kind of knew, but um, we were not in a case where we had the um, I, I an easy repro step. So I didn't, I, uh, you're, you're saying, I, I, I didn't quite understand what you were saying. It, so I didn't explain why they're not safe. I just explained what the broken assumption is. So the assumption that we were making uh, is if you create a function in realm A that only refers to locals, you then rewire the function so that uh, the object it inherits from, so that the objects that its properties point to, uh, you rewire all of the object connectivity so that it's only pointing in functions, and so only pointing at objects from realm B, and then you only use the function in realm B, you actually have nothing remaining in realm A that points at it, that treating it as if it's a function of realm B, even though it happened to have been created in realm A, is what we thought was safe. Is this related but, to the phenomenon that we've been, that has been bandied about a bit with respect to weak references and garbage collection, where you are not actually closing over something, but the implementation underneath is. So, uh, that's not, that turns out not to be the source of the problem. Okay. So, Mark, but in, in the case of the membrane, we never do such thing. What we do is we have the function of realm A never really gets to realm B. What it gets is a proxy whose job is to make sure that anything that you access out of that proxy is rewired to things that are happening in realm B, never on the realm A. Okay, okay, um, I, I might be, I, okay. Um, that's good. So you might not be vulnerable to the issues that are raising. Um, we were certainly making that assumption in our code, and it was wrong. Uh, Kennedy, how do you get to the function? How is uh, B getting the function? B can only do things with a function that are trapped via the proxy. So if you really want to evaluate or call V, I mean the function, uh, the proxy traps that and remap everything that you pass into it to the realm A and evaluate it on realm A. Um, if you are just reading things out of the function like properties or the property name or something like that, or the prototype, you're, you're going through the traps that will give you the things that you have access to in realm B. So you're, you're wrapping the function with the proxy. In order function, okay. And the proxy target, where is it coming from? The proxy target is a shadow proxy, it's a shadow target. Okay, and where is it created? Which realm is it created in? On realm B. Okay. Okay, you, uh, it, yeah. it, it sounds like you're safe. Yeah, um, it sounds like. Yeah. Okay, so good. Yeah. Um, you, you look at it and when, when I create that, I'm very specific about when, where to create that, that function, yeah. Uh, yeah. What, what realm does it belong to? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. As long as, long as the uh, the proxies are, and especially that the uh, the targets, even if they're not used, are in the target realm, um, I think you're fine. Yeah. So now I can go back and answer the, qu the question that Chip asked earlier, which is, uh, if the membrane is is completely transparent, what purpose does it serve? Well, it's still the case that it's completely transparent. It still knows, doesn't serve a purpose, but the, uh, the, the, the distortion that makes you safe 
is that the functions, the function proxies that are acting as proxy, the, the dry function proxies that are acting as proxies for wet functions are dry function proxies of the dry side, um, you know, that are themselves dry objects and whose shadows are dry objects. Uh, and that was already true, what we didn't understand. I mean, that was already true when we were building membranes that were intended to be completely transparent. So because of these weird gotchas in the language, if you just use the language to make a completely transparent membrane, but you happen to be allocating each object on the side of the membrane it represents, you will actually not build a fully transparent membrane. You will build a membrane that is safe against these gotchas in the language. Yeah, and, and I feel that um, in the case of my implementation, it's not a tra fully transparent membrane, as you said, because we do all this, plus we introduce extra semantics that we feel are sufficient to make it work. Like arrays, when they go through the membrane, they're reconstructed on the other hand, so they're, they're not live arrays, they're not live objects that can have expanders and such. So, um, yeah. Is, is, is there any reason why you don't move the copying of arrays into your distortion function? Uh, I I called move it into the distortion function, but um, because maybe yeah I can I can think of it. Performance obviously is a is a reason why not going through the through the distortion function because the distortion function is a user land code that I prefer to do that myself. But um, but yeah, also because the distortion function will have to be very carefully crafted. Because you have to create the array on the right realm, and I'm doing that internally so I can take care of it. Uh, so, the related question, which is, so you've got this nice thing where the distortion is parameterizable, so you don't have to build it into machinery, which is cool. Mm -hmm. um, which side of the membrane is the distortion function itself executing? Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, I think that's an essential question. Um, and I don't have a confident answer. My answer at this point is the, 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 the purpose of the membrane is to give you access to uh, portions of an object graph of the outer realm. And therefore, the distortion should be defined by the constructor of the of the of the of the membrane, and should be a, a distortion that happens when you're looking from the sandbox to the outer to the object graph of the outer realm. When you are trying to access something um, by receiving something from outside or by accessing something that. It's coming from already a, an object that you that is a proxy of the outside. You should get the membrane to decide whether or not you have access to that particular thing that you're trying to get access to, and get a distortion of that if needed. Okay. So, so the, the in this case there is a an asymmetry now uh, in that whichever side is setting things up is in a privileged position. Um, which kind of uh, belies a little bit the purpose of the wet dry terminology that that Mark was using, which tries to not put these in a hierarchical relationship, um, but I think they are. Yeah, the example that I used was uh, fetch. So do you have access to fetch? And what are the ways that I can get my hands on the fetch function? And, and fetch, is, fetch belongs to the outer realm. Uh, the global fetch, and maybe there is another way to get access to fetch, I don't know, by so, calling eval and returning fetch or something. But either way, uh, when, when, when I get my hands on uh, such object, I get it through the membrane, 
because it belongs there. And the, the first time that we encounter that, we make a determination that, yes, you're, you're getting your hands on a descriptor that returns fetch, but really what you're going to get is a, this other function that throws. And that's what you see. And every time that we encounter fetch coming through the membrane somehow, we're going to give you that function that throws, and that's what you can use. And if you send it back to me uh, somehow, I, I, I will be able to say, oh, you're sending me the thing that I give to you that looks like fetch, but it's throwing. But on the outside, this is really fetch, so I'm going to get fetch by. So is the following alternate story uh, a different way of describing the same conclusion? Um, that the membrane itself is a symmetric mechanism, but the asymmetry is that somebody created it. And therefore, it's, the, it's, it's whoever creates it that expresses the policy, the distortion policy, and therefore, all of the, the further objects that need to be provided in order to express the distortion policy, i.e., these, these distorting functions simply come from whoever made the membrane. So even if you have two functions, one facing in each direction, it might seem like it's a symmetric problem, but both of them came from one side. Right. That, 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 that feels very clean to me because it, you're capturing um, um, which, which side is authoritative about intent with respect to the purpose of the membrane. And, and there is also a very important distinction uh, here or, or, or thing that I, I, I believe is probably the most important one. Um, the, the creator of the membrane, which defines the, 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 the distortion, when it distorts something, it distorts it on the, on, on, the, on the realm that he has access to, not in the sandbox. So that, that means that the creator of the sandbox, you never have to deal with the internals of the sandbox. He creates it, defines the distortion saying, when I find fetch coming in, I'm going to give you this function, but this function is also uh, from the outer realm. It doesn't have to go and define a function that is inside the sandbox. It just give me a different functionality, a function in this case. And I'm going to put a proxy around. So what you get on the other end is a proxy of that thing that you said that is a fetch. Um, what the cleanest aspect of it is that as an author, I never have to think about the identity discontinuity or, or what I'm going to do that I might leak something into the sandbox. I never do that. I just create a function that works on the outer realm and give it to you. No one else has access to that function. I'm on the only one. And give is, it to you. Is, do you object to the creator of the membrane being able to provide a distortion function for each direction? I haven't encountered a, the necessity for that yet. Let's take the array copying case. Let's, that's clearly a distortion. What if we encoded, we put, we put the distortion into a distortion function, you would want to copy arrays in both directions, correct? Right, yes. Okay, good, good. Because my sense of, you know, in, in many uses of membranes, um, the, there's not much of a hierarchy that, that, uh, that there's many mutual, mutual suspicion uses of the membrane where there's still the asymmetry of somebody creates the membrane. So we need to take that into account. But once the membrane is in place, it's kind of, it can often be solving a, a symmetric problem. And I think a lot of Alex's things about two different clients of the same DOM nodes, each of which see their own expandos, but, tra but, but translate, to e translate proxies to each other without sharing expandos. I think that's an example of a membrane surface that's symmetric, but has to distort both ways. Well, this one does that too. The expandos do not leak through one side of the other. It doesn't matter. But the, 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 no. I think the key is that we, or at least I decide to go with that semantics because 
with sandboxing a, an environment, or the, the main use case at the moment was sandboxing the environment. And the environment has a very specific set of okay. APIs, even if it is the browser. Okay, um, right. And so those so, have so, a very specific semantics. Right, your use case is very asymmetric, yeah. um, uh, but as long as we enable the membrane to be parameterized with distortions in both directions, then use cases which are more symmetric can be compatible with that membrane uh, without any significant cost to the very asymmetric use case that you have. Does that seem, does that all seem correct? Yeah. Okay, good, good. So, so it, it, hey guys, two different conceptualizations of membrane that, that I think are, I think are compatible with each other, but they, they cause you to think about them in different ways. And that is the, the membrane as the thing that surrounds, I think of it in a kind of very biological way, you know, an organelle in a cell, uh, the membrane surrounds this enclosed thing and, and then the outer thing is around that. Um, versus um, the membrane that sits between two parties that have been introduced by a third party. Um, and mm -hmm. yes. the third party is the one setting up the membrane um, and to manage the relationship between these, these two entities. Yeah. Uh, ah, 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 ah. Yeah. That's, that's an especially insightful thing to focus on because now the distortion functions are coming from Alice, but the surfaces of the membrane is a Bob surface and a Carroll surface. So yeah. there's actually the membrane mechanism has to be carefully audited for the fact that uh, even a two-sided membrane might be dealing with three realms because the distortions might be coming from a third realm. That's, that's a really good insight. Um, so I want to point, I want to point to, going back to this diagram, there's one thing I didn't get to that I think is an important new insight that I want to make sure it gets said, uh, which is the initial authority. Uh, we talked through the old initial authority thinking for SES and found that it's compatible with the initial authority thinking for Caridi's world of multiple realms. And, but uh, now driven by the excess case, um, uh, the issue is if you're born into an SES environment, where are the initial authorities? They've got to be somewhere. Uh, and the, the startup code, the main code of your application uh, should on the one hand have all of the authorities that the application as a whole is given and on the other hand, um, uh, be able to, um, you know, say what the rest of the application is, essentially import the module, the top level modules for the rest of the application and then do the wiring of those modules, of the module instances to each other and of the initial authorities attenuated to the module instances. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, I'm very glad that uh, Daria is here because I think what I'm about to explain is very compatible with the Wyvern story for initial authority, but I'm not sure. Hey, hey Mark, uh, just a quick note because I have to go a uh, very hard stop now. Um, I have a meeting with this company called um, Polyverse. And they are doing some work on, around node and package node and how to secure them and such. So I recommend them to come here and present what they have. Um, it seems to be very related to other work that we have showcased here. Um, and they say that, yeah, that anytime they, they, can, they can come and talk. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what's going on there. Okay. Uh, so it sounds like you'll make out of band, you'll make contact between them and us. Yep. yep. Great. Thank you. All right. All right. Bye guys. Okay. So the key thing about lockdown is lockdown is only useful and only present when you're starting from a, a normal JavaScript environment and that you're, that you're inside a normal JavaScript realm 
that does not yet have any of the safety properties in which the global object of the code that you're executing is the genuine global object and in the browser it's the genuine window. Uh, and so let's call that code the, the code that's, that's running in that scope and running before anything has been made safe and who does not see SES semantics. Uh, let's call that code the start code. And then um, the code that, um, that the start code, the last thing it does is invoke lockdown and tell lockdown, uh, essentially tell lockdown what main is. Um, uh, and we can do that uh, by passing to lockdown a string to be evaluated, and that, that avoids a dependency of this on membranes. Um, uh, but that, whether or not that's the right way to do it, that's the way we're doing it right now. Um, but in any case, uh, the start code calls lockdown to secure the environment, uh, and then once the environment is secured, there is a initial execution context, which is now the only execution context that any further code should run in. So the start code is supposed to simply stop after calling lockdown and all the further logic of the application is in main and main is the thing that would run as the initial code in an xs environment uh, main the environment that main starts in is a is a a um, execution context whose global is not the platform global because the platform global is too magical and the safety of our evaluation shim really depends on nobody ever touching the global after initialization. Uh, so, uh, so what we do is we create this initial evaluation context and we actually copy by default all global variables from the genuine global into the new execution compartments global. So in one way, the main is executing in a tremendously unsafe environment in terms of it has all of the magical platform host objects uh, for which it can do tremendous damage. Uh, but there's no realm crossing because it's grabbed it from the, the platform global of the root realm that it's in. So there's no need to membrane it in order to separate realms. Um, uh, there's so you can add a shim if you want to reduce that power beforehand. Yes. So, um, so you, you, can, you can reduce the power uh, during the cells, during, during lockdown, if well, you so want you, to. So you can also do that simply by logic in, at the beginning of May. Yeah. Right. So the thing is, any further reduction of power is an expression of a policy decision. Yeah. And if the policy is going to be expressed by code, rather than declaratively, then that code might as well be the first thing that main does. And so, the, so on the one hand, it's unsafe because main executes with a tremendous amount of authority. But on the other hand, uh, it's safe in that the code that holds that authority is executing according to object capability rules. And if during lockdown, you, uh, the, your configuration parameters included freezing the primordials, then by the time main is running, it's running in a full SES environment with the frozen primordials. Uh, and here is kind of the realization, which is because this code is the code with the most authority, and therefore it's the most dangerous code if it has a bug, you want to you want to enhance your ability to reason safely about what the code says. So that's the code that, that is most important to get into the world of object capabilities early. 
So all of our previous attempts to sort of create and configure the initial authorities of a new realm, uh, uh, if it was the first realm, then the code that was doing the expression of policies of what authorities to, how to wire up the application in the new realm, uh, that code itself was executing in a JavaScript environment, not an SES environment. So the most dangerous code was executing in a language that's harder to reason about. And uh, Daria, remind us in Wyvern how the initial authorities are made available to the initial code that runs. It is similar. So the initial one is, so there's an object representing the platform that is being run on. And so if the main requires a lot of things from that, then we could potentially pass that object to the main module. And then there's a lot of authority, but then if, if it's not required and it's more like if there are only a couple of things that is needed from that, then we don't pass that object, but instead we instantiate whatever is needed and then pass those objects to the main. Okay, so, so, so good, this focuses, uh, um, uh, this helps focus my next question. Um, so if you're providing name with less than all authority, where is the code that expresses that? That would be expressed in the module module header, like the header for the main module. Okay. So and then you could produce it from the top level code that actually does the passing of the arguments. Okay, so it's not expressed operationally, it's expressed uh, essentially declaratively by having a white list of top level names. Uh, yes, well, there's actually another way of doing that. So that's the one that we want to be the default, but then it's also possible to have main be a pure module or almost pure module and then pass in all the necessary important objects via method arguments. It's also declarative, but it's different. So, uh, okay, so let's take that one. Uh, so in that one, uh, it's not a question of scope, it's a question of uh, what parameters you're passing in, which is great. Um, uh, but if you're going to pass in to the main some attenuation, where does the attenuation come from and how is that expressed? The attenuation would be another module or object. And so the, the same things apply, right? It could be passed as a, in the module header, in the module functor, or it can be an argument to a method. And then actually, well, there's one more way is there could be a separate object which uh, represents all the resources and then and then gets the resource to the caller by method calls. So instead okay. of doing the object passing, you just do a method call, request the resource, and then it's returned. Okay, so that code, who writes that code? The code, you mean the attenuator? Yes. Uh, that would be like, I don't know, like the architect or someone who, it's not the third party. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the author of the application, the author of the, the, the thing that is started when you start running. Right, yeah, you could say that. Okay. It's, it's not something that's written once by the language designers. It's written on a per application basis. Yes. Okay, this, so. This feels to me like um, uh, essentially, uh, drawing a pragmatic boundary between the authorities that you would like to define out of existence if you had the power to go back in time and specify what JavaScript actually was from the beginning versus the authorities which represent powers that uh, are abilities to, to affect the environment or to interact with the world, which what is appropriate and what is not appropriate is very much a judgment call based on the, the, the semantics of whatever application you're writing. Okay. Um, uh, so um, I, I wanted to continue drilling down on, on uh, Daria's scenario. So what is the name for that piece of code, the one that calls main? 
Main would be called, we call it top level code. Top level, okay. Where does the top level code get its authority from? It has it by default. Okay. So by default, it starts off with all authority and uh, its function, its purpose is to uh, basically choose what authority main needs and then call main and then all further work is done by main. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, great, great. Um, so, uh, so what we're talking about is sort of the same thing, but maybe with the term rotation, because, um, but our main is your top level. And because it's executing in an environment in which so much dangerous authority is lying around, the only thing that it should do is import top level modules, do top level wiring to distribute authority derived from the authorities it has, and then hand control over to an entry point in some top level module that's really the beginning of execution of the application logic itself. So maybe that's actually what we should call main. And the thing that's doing, that's calling that, um, top level is a fine term to use, uh, is the top level code. Um, and I think uh, um, we're following uh, the same heuristic here, I think, which is because that top level code has such tremendous amount of authority, you want it to do as little as possible. Right. Yeah. Okay, good. Good. Make it reviewable. As little code as possible, so it's easier to review. Yeah, so the thing that... The other was, metaphor that just popped into my head is in terms of we're trying to establish rules. Um, um, the top level is the constitution and your main is the legislature. Interesting. <laughs> Right, the constitution sets up the architecture of division of powers. The legislature acts with the, the, the portion of the divided powers which were given to it. Is that the, the kind of analogy you're trying to make there? Yeah, well also, also the notion that the, the yeah, the, 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 the um, in, in, yes, yes. Okay, yeah, good. So the thing that surprised me, the reason why this architecture was just a surprise to me, is the idea of creating a protected realm, a realm under the evaluator that had the raw, raw platform globals in it, uh, is not something I expected us to be doing. But, uh, but for all the reasons we just explained, it seems like it, it, it continues to seem like it's the right thing to do. And then that thing in turn should do, as, so that thing should do, that's the top level that should do as little as possible. And then once it's done that, then its evaluation context should never be used again. So basically there's two steps of abandoning the valuation concept, contexts. The startup code is abandoning the evaluation context that's not operating by object capability rules. And then the top level code is abandoning the evaluation context in which there is ridiculous amounts of authority available. Okay, that was all I had to say. Somebody's playing game or something? Yeah, so, some, somebody has a, okay, it got quieted, thank you. Um, Yeah, this is good. Um, we should uh, we should back with that. Yeah. Yes. We, yes. Especially because it's so surprising. Yeah. And because if people aren't, if it's not explained well, people would be um, too. It, it, the obvious thing to do would be to put the beginning application logic in the top level rather than in the main. Yeah. And that would be a, tr a terrible mistake because of the amount of authority there. Okay, good, good. Uh, well, it might not be easy for legacy apps to move to that world, but... Um, so legacy apps will pretty much be the main. 
Yeah. Uh, and then the top level yeah. is, is just something else. Uh, the other thing we're thinking of doing is, is to actually have lockdown itself take as an option a whitelist of global names. Uh, it defaults to copying the entire global, but if you give it a whitelist of global names, uh, then because the whitelist is declarative, it's um, useful that that's expressed by means other than code. Uh, and then uh, the copying step only copies the thing on the whitelist, so the remaining globals are, are, are never even temporarily transferred uh, to the new global, the new safe global. This seems very consistent with the whole uh, tofu line of uh, uh, thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And for, for the kind of thing that, um, as I understand it, that, that Node wants is Node wants external configuration files uh, that say what the starting authorities are of a Node process that's running a particular application. Um, uh, and that's all very consistent with this. That would be, um, uh, you know, th that would be attenuation that's outside all of this mechanism, but the attenuation that's inside this mechanism is, has the same flavor as that, which is it happens before the application logic. Should we uh, dig into APIs? You want to? You, would you like to present APIs? Um, how much more time do you have? Uh, it's um, uh, 15 minutes. It's 2:40 right now. We're trying to break at uh, 2:55. So talk about the value of the chance. Yeah, let's do that. Because it's so bloody simple. What remains an evaluator, which is the core mechanism, is just so bloody simple at this point. Resolution maybe before. Yeah, probably Okay, this is as big as I can go, so I'll share with them. Share the screen with this. I always just share my desktop as a whole because yeah. it's. Yeah, so I know this is easy. That's right down a bit. So. Yeah. Okay. Can you see the desktop? I'm talking to folks online. Yes. Can, you, can people see JF's desktop? Yes. Yes. Okay. It's quite small. Uh, maybe it can, can I go bigger? Ah. At least for the text. So, what we did is. Can you, can you take the for for me? Can you take the participant list oh, and yeah, not have yeah. it over there? Okay, <laughs> okay thank very you. good. Okay. All right. Um, so what we did is uh, after that uh, realization of that uh, the problems that we had with the realm and also this new structure, we decided to call to create a evaluation 
And its job, its responsibility is simply to create an evaluation context that isolate the uh, on-site global. So everything else that's present to the shim is removed. And uh, the top level class now is uh, this uh, evaluator. And it is a class. It's uh, no more something like a facade, um, no more evaluation of strings and rejecting strings. All it does, it's, it's a top level class. And it, it has a constructor, so you can do new evaluator. Uh, we have, um, we're going in the direction of excess where they created a top level uh, a global call compartment, which is also initialized with a new uh, a constructor. No more make, uh, make root realm and make compartment. And the uh, main difference between this evaluator and the compartment, and we thought an issue to call this evaluator uh, compartment, is that we believe that uh, the compartment will be the place where the module system and the evaluator are meeting. So this evaluator is about evaluating programs and strings, whereas a module uh, system uh, that uh, Michael, Michael has designed uh, will come into play to, co to uh, complete the API and provide a compartment API. So you will recognize the same type of uh, operation we had before, which is uh, a constructor and access to global and, and evaluate that, that takes a balance. Um, and that allows us to serve uh, both the realm and the compartment context and also uh, the module uh, loading system. The rest of the code is uh, just a simplification of the rules we saw before and uh, additions that allow us to improve security based on the findings that we had recently, uh, especially in terms of, um, yeah, we'll discuss later uh, in terms of, of what other terms of it. Um, so you get the same type of library that you had before um, available in all different types of build. Um, the test harness is all converted also to use uh, this model and uh, tests are passing and um, you get, um, if you want to run it locally, let me do, This is a simple example of, uh, of this, where we're able to create two new evaluators. And we have some source code that's just basically completion returns a, an object made of X, type of Y, and type of Z. And we create a Z value outside of the evaluator, the current context. We create two evaluation contexts, and we put some different endowments in both cases. And this is what we're supposed to get. And, uh, and this is what we're getting. So uh, the Z is not visible by anybody in any one of the two evaluation contexts. Um, X exists in the two contexts, but there's different value. And Y only exists in one of the environments. So one is a number and one is an artifact. So we get the behavior that we are ex more expected. So the next step will be to uh, we're working on, on lockdown. Uh, we're almost done to have lockdown take this new evaluator. And the next step will be to uh, then build a compartment API and, um, and join uh, Michael's work with, uh, with the evaluator. Questions? This seems sufficiently straightforward. That right. I'm kind of I'm I'm looking for the I'm looking for the catch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Has this been published already? Uh, has this been published on a on a Git repo? It's not yet been published. Uh, we are. This is why we try, we're trying to push to get uh, agreement that between everybody for disclosure soon. We understand there's a bit of delay uh, that's required by all partners uh, before code is released. 
Yeah, this, so, this, we're writing this code to not be vulnerable to things we haven't talked about yet. Yeah. So once this is ready, then uh, this is done, then we'll be able to publish. But we, uh, we, our finger is uh, anxiously on the publish button. It's, we want to make this available as soon as possible. Is it interesting to show lock in? Yeah, we could do that too. Um, it's still uh, in 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 um, transition, but uh, what we're going to have with lockdown is a top level object again that that's returned by the module, and um, and it does performs all of the steps that we need in order to secure the environment. So. It, this is, this is a pipeline. All of the steps need to happen in the same order. Um, in the past, uh, the startup of SCS uh, had to, uh, to deal with the injection of code in a new root realm. So there was a lot of strings involved in trying to be defensive against errors that occur in a different realm and not exposing that. Now, because lockdown is focused on one realm. The realm, of, the realm that's foreign, it doesn't the, even know about other realms. Exactly. So all of that complexity uh, goes away. Same thing that we have in the evaluator. For example, this method that we used to have, which was called call and wrap error. It's that complexity is gone from both systems. And so we don't have to build those strings. So we just go through the steps where we um, could we repair uh, some code that, that doesn't behave as, uh, as uh, the SES specifications. Um, there are some objects that uh, optionally can be tamed to reduce their powers. And after that is done, um, there's this uh, cleanup of the language where all properties uh, that found on objects on global objects that should not escape or should, should not should not escape should are not part of our specification are removed and we have a top level class that where is this? Um, why did I move it? Oh, in the remove. There we go. We have a whitelist of all, and that's coming uh, from the previous CS from from Kyle, all of the properties that those uh, objects should have. Yeah, and, and, and essentially, it's almost everything that's standard in in the JavaScript specification. Yes. It's an almost complete enumeration. Everything that's not that's in the specification but not in the whitelist. There's a comment in the whitelist of, of, about it. So in that sense. Uh, everything the specification is mentioned in the whitelist. Can you show me object.prototype.proto under dungeon proto? Have we gotten rid of this one yet? Um, in here, you won't see it here? Prototype. Object prototype. Yeah, so ju just search for prototype. It will be the first. The first one will be prototype? Yeah, because it won't be a dot. You know, the, the whitelist doesn't show as a dot. Oh, right, because it's the yeah. Okay. So, uh, and I it's in the named intrinsics. No, um, yeah, uh, you're searching for the, your, the search bar says object prop. So, yeah, that's it. Won't be um, just search for actually, just search for capital object colon. Okay. And then uh, colon. No, not colon. Okay, good. Uh, so that is what's tamed on object. Now scroll forward there. Okay, so the um, so for every property, including the prototype property, um, uh, we uh, describe what the whitelisting policy is. So if the whitelisting policy is in turn a whitelisting record, then that's the whitelisting policy for that for the object reached through that path. Yeah. So this is the uh, whitelist for object prototype. So uh, what I want to mention is that when we were converting things to strings and back, you see it's escape underscore underscore proto underscore underscore. 
right in the middle. Right. If I made the axis <laughs> here. Uh, right. So when you don't stringify, this should be able to be a, a bracket, yeah. Yeah. bracket quote proto. Okay. Good one. Yeah. Yeah. The um, there are bizarre rules in an object literal for if you just have the syntax of proto as a property name, it doesn't mean create a property name named proto. Um, so to avoid that, uh, we're especially recognizing the property name escaped under proto, uh, and then internally taking it to mean this is how you should whitelist the Dunder proto property. Yeah, so this was the conversion from whitelist to JSON and back again. I needed that. Okay. Yeah. So is whitelist still converted to JSON? No. It's not? Because we got rid of it? Yeah. Great. Oh, so right. Should, we're, no, we're no longer stringifying programs. We don't need to. That's right. And this should right. just be bracket, quote, dunder proto, dunder. Yeah. Yeah. As long as, uh, and, and that's the place where um, we have to assume that it's immutable. So if it's used multiple times, that nobody actually modifies it. The beauty of the the the, the JSON oh, 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 is, the white, is the that it's, it's cloning it, right? That's right. Um, right. So uh, we could we could harden the whitelist as a whole. Yeah, I um, think we should do that. But but yeah, it's assumed that this whitelist object is not being mutated. But but actually, it's only used once. So any mutation after it's used doesn't matter. And any mutation before it's used is correct. Let's put that in, in a comment. Yeah. So actually, I think we don't need to. I mean, it's, it's perfectly reasonable to actually express policy by mutating it before you run. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're just about out of time now. Yeah. So after the, all of that um, um, repair. Uh, taming and removal, then we can inject the shims if they have been provided. And the last step is the freezing and the creation of the evaluator itself that is uh, going to take the code and, it, and return the result of this uh, code evaluation. Right. And we should add options uh, for suppressing the whitelist based removal. Yeah. And we should add an option to suppress the freezing. And at that point, it should be the case that um, that this is providing everything that um, you know that Kareti needs, that Salesforce yeah. needs for, for for the way they're using it. Yeah. And you know they're building something that creates multiple root realms, would still be separate from this. But once the root realm is created, this would be the first thing that you do inside that that new root realm in order to lock it down. So you have you have options that are configuring the shim, or you may say options that are configuring the implementation. And presumably there could be options that are part of the the, the API spec itself that are in the standard. Um, do you have any examples of the latter? So date now mode is actually a perfectly good example of something that is not due to a shim limitation. It's right. something that we would actually propose. Right. Okay. So that's that's a parameterization that is made necessary by legacy JavaScript issues, as opposed to what you had to do to 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 uh, configure the shim. Okay. That makes that makes sense. Very good. Yeah. Uh, another one is. Uh, anything that interferes with the developer debugging experience, uh, I'm sorry, that, that would be a shim limitation. It should not a That would be an implementation. Um, that's right. That's right. I'm sorry. I mean, that I was, that, imagine, was, that, that, that imagine, was an example of the other side. That's right. Well, you, you've got a place for these options to go. Um, I could imagine that once, you know, assuming we are, we are successful in this, once this is incorporated into the standard and is not implemented by a shim, but is actually implemented natively in the, in the JavaScript engine. Um, that in fact, engine uh, providers might have implementation configuration options uh, that, that, that um, 
um, uh, you know, for doing things like debugging um, that are that are peculiar to their particular implementation, but but aren't related to the shim either. Uh, that's a very good point. That gives us a hint about how to separate the namespaces. That the shim is one of many implementations, and other implementations might have their own particular options. And then there's the standard options, which are just about language features rather than implementation features. Yes. Do we want to give users a clear signal that some of those options are shim only? Like having a yeah. prefix shim or something like that? I, I think, yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically where um, is, is the, the things that are specific to a platform should somehow be distinguished. Uh, and Shim is, from this pr perspective, just another platform with its own peculiar options. Right. Given that you only want to have one option configuring pathway, because otherwise that element of the API itself would be a deviation between the Shim and the... Uh... Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and then when somebody's running on the on a conformant platform that implements the whole thing, but they're running code written to the shim, one of the things we should think through is if the shim specific options are simply ignored, are we still safe? Uh, and since the default case should always be the safe case, we shouldn't lose safety if an option is ignored, but we need to, we need to make sure to be vigilant of that. It's yeah. easy for us to miss that if we're not vigilant. Yeah, I think that's probably okay, but it's probably also worth flagging. So they should not, the option should not, uh, by default, should not be required to be secure. The, the option should default to secure. Yes. Uh, but an option, uh, a, a platform specific option that includes shim specific, uh, if ignored, uh, shouldn't lead to any unsafety. In the implementation? Or on any platform that does not recognize that option. Okay. So really that's a principle actually not just for the shim, but between any two platforms. Yeah. And yes, 302. Um, I think we're at a very coherent stopping point. Okay. I actually have a question once recording's up. Once recording stops? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's stop recording. Cool. Uh, have we stopped recording?